attention, please. Worship will be starting in one minute. Please take this opportunity to prepare your hearts for worship and to be seated. And don't forget to put your cell phones on silent. ready to praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and stand up. Let's worship the Lord this morning.
Good morning. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Believers Fellowship. First and foremost, happy Resurrection Day. Amen. Amen. For those of y'all that don't speak, speak Christianese, happy Easter. It's great to have you in our service this morning. If this is your first time to Believers Fellowship, there is a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. I know that's a little bit of a stretch, so there's members. If you see somebody that's new to you, uh, no offense, but if they're new to you, just ask them to fill out one of these welcome cards, get it for them. At the end of the service, we would love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. Now, understand, we will not sell your information to a third-party vendor. Uh, we're not going to spam your email. We're not going to come knocking on your door unless you ask us to. Um, and just to get to know who you are, if you have any questions about the church, if you have any prayer requests, because there's also a section on here that allows you, if you have any prayer needs, we would love to be lifted up and standing with you in prayer. We'll put it on our prayer wall in the back. Again, we'd just love the opportunity to, to uh, pray with you. But again, after service, uh, in exchange for your welcome card, I will give you, don't tell Pastor Joe, but I will give you an exclusive Believer's Fellowship coffee mug. Limited, because I only got 20, so limited edition right here, coffee mug. So, uh, and that's first time guests, not CEOs, you know, Christmas, Easter only, not, hey, I came here last year, no, first timers, first timers only, Perry, you Perry not you, so... Love that again. Love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, and then tell you a little more information about our church. Uh, if you will, if you'll stand for me, uh, we're going to do our scripture reading in today's uh, passages out of Luke 24. Luke 20. Can everybody hear me? Because I'm getting a lot. Y'all are good? Okay. Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. And this is God's word. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Amen. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here. But he has risen. Amen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of the sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. Also, the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, Father God, without resurrection, Father, there is nothing, Father. We thank you, Father, for just what, you're, what you did, Father, sending your son down, Father, to die for us, Father, for our sins, Father, for our Savior. Because we, you, you knew we were in need of a Savior, Father. Father, we thank you for all that you do, Father. Today, Father, I pray, Father, that we just block out, of the, block out all the things, Father, that are not of you, Father. Speak to us, Father. Speak to each and every one of us that is here right now, Father. Father, we pray for those that can't be here because of medical issues or, or, or family issues, Father. Loss of loved ones, those people that are struggling, Father, we lift them up to you, Father. Father, comfort them where they are right now, Father. Father, we give you this time, this sacred time, Father, as we continue to worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. Worship you. I worship you. 
Ceresa And they call him Jesus He came to love He let
Amen. Amen and amen. Sounds good to me. You may be seated. Happy Resurrection Day to each and every one of you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So good to see you here today. Glad you joined us in worship today. Uh, what makes a day so beautiful like this? It's the Lord's Day. And uh, every day is really the Lord's Day, but we celebrate on the first day of the week the resurrection of Jesus, and we just celebrate the first day of every week that way. Amen? Because he lives and because he's risen. I want to start a series of messages today called Easter, uh, Knowing God. This is part one, so obviously we call it The Introduction. And I think that it's an important series that we'll be in. In fact, the next several Sundays, we'll be talking about this topic. And even better yet, in our small group starting next week, we're starting a whole series called Knowing God. And it's about six, eight weeks long, I guess. And it's our small group study. You do not want to miss this. If you're in small group, uh, get ready for it. If you bring someone with you, if you're not going to one of our small groups, you're really missing a blessing. Join one of them. Information's out in the lobby. But we'll continue talking about this over the weeks to come. But knowing God is probably the most important thing you will ever do in all of your life. And we want to start today just address this topic of knowing God and what that really means and what it's all about and kind of lay a groundwork for the whole series ultimately. But it is the first in the sermon series. The ultimate experience of your lifetime is pretty much on the board up there, knowing God. If you don't know him personally, then you really don't know what living is all about. When God created humanity, it was for that purpose, to know him. That was God's purpose for all humanity, although not have all have followed through. And more importantly, it is God's purpose in your personal life and God's plan in your life that's so important. And the heartbeat of all that is not about a, not about a plan and not necessarily about a purpose. It really gets down to the core of you get to know the creator, the God of all gods, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and that's the, that's the glory about what we're talking about. It is, as I've stated, the ultimate experience of your whole lifetime. So let's talk about the introduction. I shared this with you a few weeks ago, but I felt it would be good to bring it back one more time. I did a Google search. Anybody ever do that? So I asked Mr. Google, whoever he is, how to know God. And it's an interesting. First thing that pops up is a list on how to know God. And it's a list of five things that you need to do to know God. Uh, I read it. I'm going to read it to you, no, but it doesn't mean I approve it, all right? <laughs> on number one on Mr. Google's list was change your thinking about yourself and about God. Now, I can certainly agree with that. Change your, your thinking about yourself and about God, all right? So that's step one. Step two, now you regard every thought of God as God. That'll get you in a lot of trouble, by the way. Ask my wife. I, I, every thought comes to my mind is not God, and it shouldn't be said, all right? <laughs> number three. Practice believing that God dwells in you already. Okay. Number four, remember that God dwells in everybody else too. Be still, number five, be still and know that I am God. I am God. All right, we got troubles already, amen. It's interesting, if you continue to look down the Google topics that are listed up there, there's a whole lot of things that follow page after page after page hundreds if not thousands of different philosophies and ideas and religions on how you can know God. It seems like there is no end to the philosophies or the ideas or the doctrines that are out there about how to know God. So I'd like to refer to the best book on the subject that I know of, and that's the Holy Bible. It's been written and written in truth. The Bible says it is inspired of God. And so let's look to that to know how to know God. Remember that every relationship that you have in your life begins ultimately with an introduction. Even my children. First thing I did when they were born is I put in my hands, I introduced myself. I'm your daddy. Get over it now because it's going to be a lifetime, all right? <laughs> but it starts with an introduction. Here's the beautiful thing about knowing God. You know, that he initiates the introduction. He's the one who, who starts the process. So, uh, all of us, if we do know the Lord or have an experience with God in our life, it started with an introduction. Somebody told us about him. Somebody told us how to know him. Somebody told us about how God loves us. And we began to listen to the introduction and then finally made our way to him and followed through with that. A lot of people that think it's kind of natural and normal to seek God, it really isn't. And the reason it isn't because the Bible makes it clear that we're all born in sin. And it says about that, it says that, uh, that we're always seeking our own thing and wanting our own will, <coughs> excuse me, in our own way. 
so in following that idea, not everybody's looking for God, all right? And most aren't. There are two passages that I'm familiar with, one in the book of Romans chapter 1 and Roman in the, one in the gospel of John chapter 1 that talk about how God puts it in the heart of men to know him. But we're still sinners. The Bible says every man has gone his own way and seeks his own way. So even with that introduction, we, we ignore it. The Bible says that God comes as light and brings light to the heart of every man, but not every man accepts it. The Bible also says, when it, back in Romans chapter 1, that God has made himself known by creation itself. In other words, there's such order, there's such beauty in nature and in the world and in the cosmos and the universe that God has made himself known by all those things. But it goes on to say that men would rather serve the creature, worship himself, than he would to worship God. Or one of my lenses just fell out. There it is. That makes for an interesting sermon. But I preach out of one eye. Well, let's get on with it, all right? Let's talk about the first truth I want to introduce you to here. Wonderful truth number one is that God wants you to know him. God initiates this. Even though we may stray and we go our own way, John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave. So there it is, God doing. God gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting eternal life. So you see God is the initiator of the relationship. So the introduction God is seeking to make and he makes it via his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is there to give us the opportunity to know God. So we see how much God does want to know us. We see that God is a God who desires to have a relationship with us and to have fellowship with us. But again, we have this resistant problem with our old nature. So God starts it. He's the initiator. And I think it's important you understand that, that we really aren't the initiators. There may be some things happen in my life that get me interested in God. Some people say, I just came to the end of myself, found out that wasn't the answer, and I started looking. Some people have events and occurrences in their life. Some people have other people around them that start driving, stirring up the curiosity in their life. But I understand, first and foremost, that God loves you so much that he started this process of knowing you, and he gives us this truth that he wants us to know him. The second point I want you to see is that God has sent the invitation, all right? And the invitation is the gospel. 1 Corinthians there gives you just a little snippet of what the gospel is. It says, For I delivered unto you the, uh, for, uh, as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now catch that phrase twice according to the Scriptures. The Bible is, is laid out in the Old Testament and New Testament. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ was born, there were scriptures that were written in the Bible about his coming, that a Messiah would come. Even in Genesis 3, the fall of Adam and Eve, God promised that he would send a Redeemer then. So it goes all the way back to the beginning. When man first fell, God starts moving, all right? In fact, the Bible tells us that God had the plan before man ever fell, before man was created. So here's God in this initiation process, sending his son. He comes, the son of God, born of a virgin, the Bible says, Without sin. Now, if he'd been born of some other man in the culture, he'd just inherited that same, you know, disease called sin, that, that same epidemic we all are born with in sin or with the sin nature. But he's not. He comes in, virgin born, the son of God. He lived a perfect life. The Bible says he was without sin. He, it's, he was without sin because he wasn't a sinner by nature like we are, all right? His nature was not bent towards that and warped towards that like ours is. That he came without sin. And not only that, he proved he was the Son of God. No telling how many hundreds that we know of just written in Scripture of miraculous events that Jesus is doing time and time again, proving his deity, proving his sonship, proving who he really is. In fact, the word miracle, we use the word miracle, is a word which literally translated as a sign. In other words, every miracle that Jesus did, whether it was feeding the thousands, raising the dead, walking on water, whatever it was, calming the storm, every miracle that he did was simply that, a sign. A signpost, a billboard that says, this is God's son. This is the way to life. This is the way, the truth, and love. And it comes through Jesus Christ the Lord. So we have this invitation from God and God's son who comes, and this is the message of the gospel, virgin born, lives the perfect life, and then he goes and gives himself as the sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And that he was raised on the third day. And really the whole of the gospel doesn't end there. It ends with, and he's coming back again. Just as there were 
prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament given the fact that Jesus is going to come as Savior of the world. Isaiah called him that sheep led to the, to, to the slaughter, you know, just like a lamb, but he, he took upon himself the sins of all of us. 800 years before Jesus did that, it was prophesied that he'd be born, he'd be raised, he would die for our sins, he'd be raised on the third day, all right? All that was prophesied, and he did it according. But all that encompasses ultimately the gospel message, and he is coming back again. I appreciate many of you prayed for me last week while I was in Arkansas being a conference on prophecy and leading that conference talking about how the Lord will return. What are the signs of the time? But that's all part of his message so that you can know him and you can know him for all eternity. So understand, that's the gospel message. Maybe you've heard that word, gospel. People use it around. It means literally the good news. And that is good news because without him and without Jesus and without his sacrifice for our sins, we're really lost for all eternity. So third point I want you to catch this morning, not only has God started and initiated the invitation and sent us this gospel message, he has arranged the meeting. And let me say this about that. Jesus is the meeting point, all right? Jesus is the place we come to. The, the empty tomb is just a, a symbol and a sign that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, that he's no longer there, that, that he rose victorious so that it's, it's a sign that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins, and he raised him up from the dead. And the Bible says he's given a name above all names, and at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? So here's the Lord. He's arranging the meeting, and it's through his son. Now listen to what his son says. Here's how you, here's how you get God. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and catch the last that no one comes to the Father but through me. Now, I know in this cancel culture day that we live in that that is certainly politically insensitive and incorrect. For Jesus Christ to make such a bold, arrogant statement that he's the only way to meet God, he's the only way to know God, well, that just ruffles some feathers, and be sure it rankles some people in his day and time as well, all right? But he, by the way, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father by, by him. He's the only one who could ever say that in all of creation. So, and I'm sure that there are people today who look at this, and I hear people ridicule that. They, they probably kind of come up with this thing we've all heard that, well, you know, Jesus is a way, and, you know, when you look at all religions of the world, they're really just, there's many paths leading to the same mountain. It's that same concept and mindset that says, you know, well, you take away all the, all the different aspects of different religions and just get down to the core simple beliefs of people. Then it really, you know, they all, they all pretty much teach the fatherhood of God and the, the brotherhood and the sisterhood of humanity or whatever, you know, and that we all, you know, should, we all can know God by just following uh, these different paths. But that's not what Jesus said, is it? Jesus said something completely different. There, there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, that well, the way you get to God is, you know, is you follow this course or follow this path. You know, that, then this is how you're going to know the truth. But that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus said, I am the truth. All right? There are a lot of religious teachers and a lot of religious philosophers who will get up and notate all the religious leaders of the world and tell you, you know, well, you know, uh, there's a way to God and this is the way, a way to God. A lot of religious leaders say, follow me, you know, I'll show you the way, you know, to God. But Jesus says completely something different. I am the way. And if you want to get to the Father, in fact, he says in, in John, I am the door. That's a bold statement, is it not? I'm the door. This is how you get to God. And this is the only way you're going to get to God. There's a lot of religious leaders and philosophers who say, hey, follow me and I'll lead you to life. But Jesus made a declaration that I am the life. I am eternal life. In me is life. He that has the Son hath life. All right? So life comes through Christ Jesus. So it's not politically correct. I know that. It doesn't fit the scale of religious, you know, uh, theologies of the world today. But this is truth of what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it catches. You want to come to the Father. This is the way that you have to come to God the Father. But here's our problem with this whole gospel message. Here's our problem with that way, truth, and life. We are in sin when we're born. 
and the heartbeat, the, the core of, of sin nature is self, pride. We want our will, we want our way, we want what we want, we want it when we want it, we want it how we want it. That's just where we're bound up and we're in our sin. None of us are perfect. Anybody got that yet? All right, we're all born in sin. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, there's something in your own experience, if you'll be honest, you know that. I mean, does anybody really have to stand up here in the pulpit and say, you're all sinners? <laughs> no, we know that, all right? I mean, we don't even have to be religious to know that. I think we, we know our imperfections. We know our flaws. We, we do stupid stuff. We say stupid stuff. We didn't want to say it. We did it anyway. We're just bound by our sin. But here comes Jesus who knows no sin and goes to the cross to die for us on the cross and pay the price for our sin and suffer for us in our sin and to change us. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves as our Lord and as our Savior. We have to come to him. We're sinners. So Jesus says, I can cleanse you. I can remove the sin. I can remove the stain. Other religions kind of look at how to get to God and it's spelled by one simple word, two letters, D-O, do this. Do this and you get to God. Do this. If you do one, two, three, four, you'll get to God. If you do one, two, three, maybe ten, you'll get to God. Keep the Ten Commandments, you'll get to God. But the Bible never teaches that. Christianity is not, not spelled that way, you know. It's not spelled, we, we, we do this, we do that. Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E, done. It's all been done. Jesus Christ took your place, the wages of sin fell upon him, and he died for me and for you. That is a, a glorious freedom because I think something even in our own experiences, you know, if I'm not perfect, how can I ever be perfect? Or how can I ever match made and meet great? Because God is perfect and he's holy, but here I am separated from God. And use a good Bible word, I'm unholy, all right? So how, how are we going to bridge this chasm, get across this? Jesus comes and he said, I'm the way. I'm the door, all right? This is the way you get to God. And it's not by do this, do that, don't do this. It's, it's by, in fact, I'm going to do what you can't do. I'm going to do for you what you can't accomplish. I'm going to pay the price for your sins, and I'm going to take it upon myself. Let me give you an analogy. You have a child, and a child has arrhythmia, irregular heartbeat. And you go to the doctor with your child, and the doctor's going to say something like this. The child's going to need a pacer to keep the heart in rhythm. Now, you could say, oh, well, I don't like that. I don't like what that involves. And I think there certainly must be a better way to get the heart in rhythm. Maybe we can scare the child, you know, and maybe get it back into rhythm. Or maybe we can, you know, bathe the child in hot water or dip her in chlorine or whatever it might be, bleach, and somehow get rid of that, that arrhythmia problem. We can do something about that. And the doctor says, no, listen, that's not going to work. I mean, you can do all those things you want to do, but the child needs a pacer. Well, what if we just ignore what you're saying? I, because that offends us that you think our child needs a pacer. All right? That, that, that hurts our feelings. And so what if we just, and, and just ignore what you're saying, pretend that it's not true, and by the way, it is your truth. Our truth says he's, the child's okay. But your truth, listen, I practice medicine. I'm a physician. I've done hundreds of these procedures. There's my certifications on the wall. You can look at them. I'm educated for this. I'm trained for this. This is the way to cure your child, the doctor says. Otherwise, you can do all these things you want to do. You can chant and pray and scrub and dip them in chlorine or whatever you want to do, but your child is not going to be saved without this pacer. That is the cure. But this is the way people approach God. God, you say the problem is sin. I don't want to deal with that, you know. I, I don't want to talk about that. Now, certainly, I don't want to go to church and hear about sin. <laughs> I, I don't want to talk about it. But Jesus says the only way you're going to be dealt with and taken care of because what's keeping you from knowing God is sin. And so I've sent my son to take your sin upon himself and to offer you as a free gift eternal life. Well, I don't like that. I, what, if I just, what if I'm sincere? You know, and I really am sincere because a lot of people say, well, they're so sincere in the faith. How can they be wrong? Hey, you can be sincerely wrong. <laughs> Amen. Have you ever, anybody else here? I mean, that's kind of been my experience at times in life. I've been sincerely wrong about stuff. So it doesn't matter. But what if, what if I just scrub it and wash it? No, listen, no matter holy water or baptismal water or Jordan River water, 
is going to tell, de deal with the issue that is the issue of our heart, and that is our sin. But here's the thing about Jesus Christ has done what needs to be done. And he died for our sins. And top that off, the stone has been rolled away from the tomb, all right? And he's come out of that death payment for on your behalf and my behalf and been declared victor and Lord and King of Kings. And so the work has been done. The resurrection is the proof that the medicine is there, all right? And that it's, that it's, that it's, that it's effectual and it'll change your life. Jesus said, I'm the door. And let me say, the door is open for you to go through. The invitation is from God for to come. Whosoever will may come. So if the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart and speaking to your life, you should come. Now, I know from practical experience what I'm talking about here, all right, because I heard about God at a young age. And I've, you know, gone through some religious activities at a young age. But the older I got, the more I became committed to the fact I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want anybody else telling me what I need to do. All right? Now, I didn't say it out loud, but here was the bottom line. I'm just going to be my own God. I'm going to live the way I want to live. And here's the thing about it. The more I chose to live the way I want to live, the, the emptier I became. Or maybe I just realized how empty I was. And I, I ran from God I, and that, that invitation because I was aware of it. I didn't want it. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I thought my life, my joy, my happiness could be found in these relationships or in the world or in all these other activities in my life. I, I, I even dabbled in some other religions, all right? I had a friend who was very in, involved in Eastern religions, and he started teaching me those things and telling me how, you know, that we're all just, you know, just part of this great life circle, and on, on it went, you know. We just need to become one with the universe. But the more I looked at the universe, I saw how messed it up it was, all right? The things for people are just messed up. The world was messed up. People are going the wrong direction. Their lives are empty. It doesn't take a, a lot of looking around. I remember I, I went out in 72, I went out to Las Vegas, all right? And I went out there looking for a job as a musician. And man, my eyes were, uh, the Lord was dealing with me, praise God. But here were all these people who were out there just to have fun, and they were just so miserable, you know? Just getting lit up and intoxicated as they could just to feel comfortable in life. What a, what a misery it was. I ended up leaving there. Tried to be a better person. That's this is what I'll need to do. In fact, I think I'll go to church, and I did that, all right? Cut off my long hair, you know. Put my, my guitar away for a while. And stop. You know, God, God, God I'm going to be a better person. That's the scrubbing in, the, in the, the bleach water part. It doesn't work. Until finally, here's the grace of God. He keeps reaching, he keeps calling, and he keeps speaking to us. How many of you experienced that in your life? Praise God for that, amen. And some of you may have not realized that that's what's going on, but you know something's been happening in your heart, but God's been calling you and dealing with you. I mean, that's the reality of it all. Comes and here's Jesus Christ paying the price. And this, folks, this is, this is where life begins. This is responding to the, the invitation. It's responding to the introduction that God has done everything that needs to be done on your behalf for you to come into a personal relationship with him. And, and it's just not... You know, hello, I'm Joe, I'm God, thank you, it's good to meet you. And they go off our merry way. <laughs> it's a, it's, it starts a life. It's, a, it's, a, it's purpose is now found. Dis, you discover fullness begins to come in. And for every person who's ever experienced that, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And you also know what it's like when you say at some point in that relationship, I, I'm going to try to go back and be what I, in control of my own life. You know how easy that is. But God's just merciful and God is gracious and God is loving. God will chasing us when we, we need it. He brings us back. This is the relationship that begins. And this is some more we'll talk about in, in the days ahead and we'll even study in our lift groups. But it came back to the point of how did, how did I respond to the invitation? Well, it comes to my responsibility point. What's, what's my responsibility? If he's done it all, what do I need to do? There's two Bible words that are just great. Jesus used them in one verse of the Bible. Says, he said, Jesus said, except you repent, you'll perish. But another place he said, you must believe. He that believes will have life. He that does not believe does not have life. So there's these two words in the Bible, uh, repentance and belief, and you call it repentance and faith. It's really like one coin with two sides. You flip it, and on one side comes down faith. That means I trust in God. What about the repentance card? It happens naturally because when I choose to follow God, guess I'm not following anymore. I'm not following the world. I'm not following me. I'm not following the devil anymore, amen? 
I'm choosing to trust. So it's really just kind of, it's a combined thing of I'm turning from something. Boy, in 1973, I chose to turn from that, and I turned to Christ, and I have not been disappointed. I know God's been disappointed with me at times, but I've not been disappointed with him. He's always been faithful. He's always been true. He's always been right on for me and, and right there when I've needed him. He's always been faithful to me. So I started, yes, Lord, and I accepted him. I asked him to come into my life. I asked him to forgive me. And the introduction was completed at that point. A relationship began. And now it's a journey. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the Bible says, we're journeying. We're walking with God. But it starts here. It starts with the gospel message. You, you just can't say, okay, I'm going to be a better person. You, you can try that. See how that works? It doesn't work. All right? Because it goes beyond just being a better person. It comes down to being a changed person. Jesus literally transforms us. He changes. I mean, there's this whole work of grace that God does in us when we choose to believe. If that has not happened in your life, I am praying that you'll respond to the introductory call today, that God has introduced himself to you, that he's shown himself that he cares for you by sending his own son. And you choose to do as Jesus said, to follow me. He said, follow me. There it is. Now we're walking. Now we're moving. And we're moving in a relationship that gets deeper and more real and more intimate as time goes on. I can't encourage you enough today. If you're here and you've never begun that relationship, to deepen your heart. And that's where it starts, you know. It's not about putting on a show for anybody. It's deep in your heart. You say, Lord, I know I don't have that life that Jesus died for me to have. I don't have it. And I, I, instead, I feel guilty. I'm aware of what I've done, all the things I've done that are wrong. I need you to forgive me. I accept your gift of forgiveness today. And I allow you, I, I choose to follow you. I allow you to come into my life and make me a new person. I mean, that can be prayed a thousand different ways and said a hundred other different times. But, but it really gets down to that first decision, real choice for Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that will forever change your court and destiny. Forever. And that's the grace of God. That's just the starting point of walking with him. But that's where it all begins, and that's where it all comes to. This is, this is where, you know, when, when I came to a place of really listening to God and accepting what the Lord had to say for my life, choosing to say, Lord, I, 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 I believe you. I believe what Jesus did. I believe you love me that much. It came down to the decision. But I'll, I'll guarantee you, it was not an easy decision. Because there was so much internal struggle. And I didn't realize it because I was pretty spiritually naive about spiritual things. I didn't realize there was a spiritual war going on. I didn't realize so much the devil part of it, you know, that Satan hated me so much and that he hates all humanity. And he hates you because the Bible says you've been made in the image of God. So every time he sees a human, it just, it just, he just despises us. He hates us with a passion that can't even be described properly. All right? He can't stand you. And that's why he has this one weapon he uses against us, and it's called the father of lies. And he would tell, he would tell me so many lies. Oh, don't do that, Joe. You know, if you ever do that, then you're not going to have any fun. Oh, don't do that, Joe. You're going to mess up your life. You're not gonna, you, you, but, Joe, you do that, man, your friends are going to leave you. All that junk, he just heaps on. A choice has to be made. Who's going to win the battle? Who are you going to listen to? Who will you respond to? Will you listen to the liar? Or you listen to truth. Hear the words of Jesus. I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the life. No one will come to the Father but through me. Hear that call and respond to him. It's a call of mercy. It's a call of love. It's a call of grace. I'd ask you to stand with me with your heads bowed for a moment. I'd ask your musicians to come to the stage. <clears throat> Each and every one of us have experienced different things in our life. We've walked so many different paths. We've had so many different trials, but so much of them have really been the same in reality. In the midst of all of it, there's been a God who loves you, and there's been a God who's calling you. I don't know, but I, I trust you heard somewhere in the midst of all the chaos and confusion of the culture and the age, the mercy of God appealing to you. That he's revealing himself in your life and in your heart. That invitation call to the same. If you've never responded to that, I encourage you today to make what I believe is the most important decision in your life. Will you stand against those, those, those volumes of lies and just say, I'm going to follow the truth. That in your heart, you just ask God to come in. 
Open your life to him. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and live with him. Sup with him. Fellowship with him. Have you, do you sense that call in your heart and life? Has that ever happened? If you're here today and you're sensing that, why don't you just right there with your head bowed, just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life and forgive me of my sins. I choose to follow you from this day forward. I choose your salvation. Maybe you're here as a child of God. You've known that you've known the Lord. You've made that commitment in the past. But you're one of those things that haven't been really right between you and your Heavenly Father. Because you've somewhere turned and started pursuing your own way again. The Bible says if we confess our sins to Him, not to me, not to a man, but if we confess our sins to Him, that He is faithful, He's a just God, that He'll forgive you. And not only that, He will cleanse you from all every sin, all unrighteousness. You can renew that relationship, fellowship, walk, and love and journey with Him. What a merciful, great God. I'd encourage you in this time that you would just open your heart and respond to the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing and worship. As we do, Pastor Gary's going to be here. I'll be up here. If you'd like to come and confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to do that today. If that's never happened, the Bible says, for with a, man, with, with a heart, a man will believe unto righteousness. You make a heart decision. But then it says, with your mouth, confess that Jesus is Lord. There comes a time when you have to stand for your faith. Own up to Jesus. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, then I'll be ashamed of you when I come in with my angels in glory. Stand for him now. Live for him now. If you're a believer here today, God's spoken to your heart about restoring and renewing your joy and your fellowship. I mean, you just want to come to the altar between you and, and your Lord and have a word of prayer. Just respond to whatever the Holy Spirit's saying to you. But God is here in this room right now wanting to do a work in each of our hearts. The band sings and leads us in worship. Would you come? Maybe you just want somebody to pray with you and pray for you. Would you come? We'll be glad to pray for you and pray with you. But let's just open our hearts. Father, you know each and every one of us in this room. I ask you in Jesus' name to draw us closer to you we've ever been before in our lives. Give us courage and grace to stand, to be humble. In Jesus' name, as we worship, would you come?
who you are. He is here today. I am praying that you responded to whatever the Holy Spirit was saying to you. We've had four services at Believer's Fellowship today now, and I believe that all of them, God showed up, God touched lives, and God touched hearts. encourage you today. Gary mentioned something about the commit comment cards and the commitment card, the welcome card that's in the, the backs of the seats in front of you there. Today, maybe you're still struggling in your heart, man, because I know what it's like to be in a service and know that God's telling you something and not respond, but have questions. If you have questions, listen, Pastor Gary or myself, I'd love to reach out to you and talk to you. Just fill out one of those comments cards. Say, I'd, I'd like to talk to one of the pastors and just put a contact or phone number or text number, however you want us to reach out to you, email, however you like, and we will get with you. And just drop it in one of the offering receptacles at the back of the auditorium. You may be seated. Thank you for being here today. We have a few announcements before we close, but I didn't want that to get away from you. But if you're still saying that, Pastor, I've got some questions, right? I need some help or some instruction. Then you just take a moment, put your name down, contact information on there, and uh, one of us will reach out to you. I want to talk to you. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So, again, for the first-time visitors, uh, if you do fill out the welcome card, uh, again, we will, we'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, have a, a gift in your hand. Um, it would be our honor to lift a prayer request up to you and stand with you in prayer for that. Um, and so we will meet you at the end of the service in the uh, foyer to my left as you exit to the left. Uh, regarding our lift, which Pastor Joe talked about, our new lift study that starts on the 11th. If you have any questions about our lift or small groups that Bible studies, that's going to be as you exit on your right. We'll have some lift group leaders out there. Uh, if you have any questions, they'll be able to answer them for you. Also, you'll be able to look at the lift book study. If you, uh, For those that are currently in a lift group, uh, get with your lift group leaders. The cost is $5. If you've never been for the book, if you've never been to a lift before, this first series uh, the book is uh, on us as a, as a gift to you to, to be a part of Lyft. And so there's two opportunities to join us. You can join us before church at 9 or after uh, in the evening. We have three Lyft groups in the evening uh, starting at 530. We have um, two um, adult Lyft groups and then one young, young adult career college ready uh, college age Lyft group as well. And we're all going to be in the study, the journey to knowing God. Don't forget to join us. Uh, I'm sorry, Journey 101 classes, April 18th. This is our introductory classes, Journey 101. You want to know more about the church, you've recently given your life to Christ, you've, or you're thinking about joining the church, this would be the class for you. It's going to be April 18th at 3 p.m. Uh, don't forget to join us May 9th for Mother's Day. Uh, start inviting your mothers to church. We'll have a gift. We have a great message for them. We'll also have a free gift for them. Also, we'll have a photo booth for families before church and after church. So bring your moms. Take, we'll have uh, 
a photo booth in our fellowship hall for you to sign up and, and get get that picture as well with you and your family. Uh, don't forget to stay connected with us on Facebook, YouTube, and bfchurch.com. For our on- guests and online viewers, again, if you fill out the welcome card online and join us on Facebook, you can go to our website, website bfchurch.com, click on the guest tab, fill out the short survey, and we will uh, get in contact with you. Uh, finally, don't forget your tithes and offering. Three ways to give. You give in person. And we don't pass a plate here at Believers Fellowship. And we have off receptacles in the back. It is, uh, you know, giving is a part of worship, and so continue to worship the, the Lord with how he's provided for you. Continue to give uh, what God has called you to give. You can also give online at bfchurch.com. Click on the uh, Give tab, or you can drop it, in, drop it off at the church Monday through Thursday. Finally, tonight is family night. No evening services. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. Everybody be safe. Um, And we'll see you on Sunday. Amen. You're dismissed.